don't know if you saw some video that trended yesterday. Just before President Trump left Davos for the United States. There was this Nigerian, very well dressed, very robust. Obviously, um, there was the impression that the man is wealthy. And obviously, he had tried to talk to President Trump. And, and one of President Trump's aides passed the phone to the president. So this Nigerian goes, Mr. Trump, what exactly were you saying about Africa? And of course, you know the president. He feigned ignorance. In fact, almost denied that he said anything. So the guy said, look, for years I've been trading with China. I do very good business. Because based, but based on what you just said in Davos, I, I thought I should give America a chance. I want to move away from China and begin to do business with America. Only on one condition. That you totally apologize and withdraw this thing about shithole in Africa. So the president said, well, okay, I mean, we'll think about that when we get back to Washington. And then Trump says, but exactly where are you from? Which, which, which country in Africa? <laughs> and the guy goes, Nigeria. And he says, Nigeria, can you spell that? And he said, of course I can. And he goes, Enno for Enugu. <laughs> eye for eyes. G for Jesus. <laughs> e for Ibadan. <laughs> R for Arabia. Again, I for eyes. And A for Elizabeth. <laughs> On that note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you <laughs> to my part of the presentation. You know, when I was invited to participate in this, I told the gentleman that you all know as Ken, that I call Kunle, who happens to be my brother-in-law. He's my wife's junior brother. I said, Kunle, what am I doing? I, I have no business being here. You know, I spent my entire life in marketing communications. So you guys want to talk about Whatever you want to talk about. That's prayer coming back, to, back home and investing in Nigeria. And he said, that's the exact reason why we want you to participate. We want you to share your experiences in the hope that the lessons that you have learned we brought to the table and then we can learn from that and hopefully make decisions easy for us. And that's why I'm here. Senator Ben Murray Bruce and I come a very long way. I think, fella, the wonderful speaker that he is, talked about some of his escapades in the past. Let me use the word escapades. <laughs> All those days that he was bringing wonderful artists to Nigeria and selling what I call junk films, Brazilian films. Ben and I, I mean, this man here, and this was long before he became a senator, his entrepreneurial spirit just amazed everybody. And you needed to see this man convince you to do whatever he wanted. And that was when I started noticing him. Because at the time, we had started running what eventually became a very big company, but a very small company at the time. But I think he also saw our potentials. So what I'll do is tell you my story and what I've been able to do 
in these past 47 odd years or so, um, I'm not so sure that there's anybody in this room that works in the business in which I have engaged, which is marketing communications. Okay, I see one hand up. Forty-seven years ago, I started the journey, and very quickly, I was lucky. I worked in a company that was partly American-owned and Nigerian-owned. Um, and some of the owners of the company and my directors at the time included the father of the president of Nigerian Stock Exchange, Chief Chris Ogumbanjo. And they gave me the opportunity to learn and become what I am today. And thankfully, Chief Chris Ogumbanjo is alive and kicking. And I usually have the privilege and opportunity to see him once every Tuesday at the Metropolitan Club, Club in Lagos. And I continue to pay my respects and extend my appreciation for what he did, he and the late Chief Lawson did for me. So in that company, I rose very quickly. Um, four and a half years after I joined, I became, I was invited to join the board. And I worked as the deputy managing director of the company for another four years. By which time, and I'm talking about entrepreneurship, that's what I'm talking about this afternoon. Entrepreneurship in Nigeria, the Troika experience. That is my experience. Now, second year into my directorship, I noticed that the company started losing focus, should I put it that way? And I, I want to be very generous now. And at that stage, I started thinking, should I remain here? Because, you know, there are certain things they will teach you in college but which experience would teach you better. And there are, in fact, certain things that they would not even teach you in college at all. And that was my experience. That I needed to learn fresh things. And one of the things that I discovered very early in life was that once your passion begins to diminish, in any organization, it is time for you to move on. Now, that company, when I joined it, was the third biggest in my profession. And I was there, six years, we were still number three. I thought we needed to challenge for number one. But my colleagues didn't think that that was necessary because, in any case, the company looked after us. Um, why should we kill ourselves? And I do not have that mentality. I, be, I like to be number one. And so, quite a long story short, I left. So, I asked the question, what actually motivates an individual to become an entrepreneur? It could be like they would tell you in school that it's because you're looking for profit, it's a profit motive, that could jolly well be right. The second could be that you want some other rewards. But in my case, it wasn't about profit, perhaps because I was naive. What I wanted to prove was that we could do it better than the guys who were in front. So I was challenging for leadership. The other thing they would tell you in school is that you got to have capital before you venture. I had no capital. I didn't even have the talents that would come with me. 
I don't know how many of you watched the film The Dirty Dozen. Twelve rookies, twelve criminals who had to go and ensure that some German top-notch were displaced and captured. But it took leadership. The major who controlled those two, 12 guys to polish them and ensure that they were able to do that which they were expected to do. So what I did was to find my own dirty dozen. Rookies who had worked with me before, but I, I, I could see in them, in fact, some of them I hired myself. But what I saw in them was intellect. Which is what all of you in this room have. Which we miss badly in Nigeria and which Nigeria needs very, very badly. So, I am saying that, see that in this room, how do you guys come together? Maybe in threes or fours? with somebody who will be the clear leader and then make a change in Nigeria. Because that's very important. The moment I was able to find the five other guys that I chose, only five of them, I was confident that we could take on the world. There was none of those guys who had more than three years working experience in advertising at the time I did. I, as their leader, had close to eight years experience. But I thought that we could take on the world. So we started the company. Capital, we had 280,000 Naira and 104,000 debt. Now that 280,000 Naira I had to go and find shareholders from outside. One of the guys that I took with me and I said to them, you all are going to be shareholders, was able to put down 500 Naira only in the company. And then the outsider that I found put in 25,000 Naira. I put in all of my own life savings, which amounted to about 40,000 Naira. So there was a lot of money at the time. This was in 1980. So I went and I said to myself, I had to think big. How do I go out there? No client, not one client. So I had a client that I worked for who was based in the UK. It was a correspondence school called International Correspondence Schools. So I sent him a cablegram at the time, cablegram. You guys know what cable grams are? Yes. Okay. Saying so I was quitting my job, I needed to let him know officially. And he said, what, are that, what are that, was I going to do? I said, I was going to start an advertising company. He said, you can take my account. And his total billing at the time was 10,000 Naira. So that was my first line, 10,000 Naira. So, but I said, I got to tell the world that I meant business. So I went to Sru Lere, those of you who know Lagos very well, and I took a whole building, a whole building, I went to Leventis, Leventis at the time you could get what they called higher purchase, I went to Leventis, they gave me all the air conditioning, they gave me a generator, standby generator. Um, I tried to buy some carpets. There were cheap tap carpets you could buy. Went to NASCO. They did cheap carpets at the time. Anyway, did the office very nicely. There must have been about, in that house, maybe about 16 rooms in it. We didn't need more than six rooms. So I locked the other rooms. But gave the impression that I was a very big company. And then we started. Now, I made an assumption. I thought that the clients I had worked for before, who knew my expertise, would just come with us. 
So I wrote them nice letters. Say, listen, listen, I left. Blah, 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 blah. Now we're ready to work for you. And they all wrote back to say, you know, yes, Bjorn, we know you are good. But there was a structure behind you. The grand structure was behind you. That structure is no longer there. So sorry, there's no way we can come with you. So cut a long story short, in three months, ran out of cash. I went to look for another investor who put in 50,000 Naira. So I would pay salaries. I wasn't paying myself any salaries. Now, don't forget, I thought when I left Grand, I had two official cars. I had a driver. I had a cook steward. I had, oh, interestingly, the house I used to, the last house I lived in before I moved out, when I left that house, I told the company, can I take over this house? And they said, no, 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 you can't. Anyway, big trouble. They wouldn't allow me. Um, they said some expatriate was going to stay in the place, which was a lie. The place was locked up for two years. No tenant in it. The next tenant in that house was, guess who? Aliko Dangote. The richest man in Africa. He was the next tenant in that house. So what I'm saying to you is that we can look at all these wonderful entrepreneurs who made successes. They started from somewhere. Today, people here have Aliko, they would never know that he lived in Sri Lanka and was a tenant. Let me fast track a little bit. So, we struggled on. Sometimes I would get paid, sometimes I wouldn't get paid. And then I had my first problem. Entrepreneurship, I'm talking about entrepreneurship. Because if you guys go and establish a company and bring people you don't know into the business because they have money, they can become problematic for you down the line. My first baptism of fire, come December of that year, I looked at the staff. We didn't have business, but I was clear in my mind that if I didn't look after these five guys that I brought with me, in fact, when we opened shop, I should tell you, I opened shop with 18 people. We were 18 when we started. Plus T-Girl, plus Messenger. I brought 18 people. 240,000 naira capital. <laughs> you know, it was like some guy who'd gone bonkers. <laughs> so end of the year, I was looking at my Another operating plan for the following year, so we had a board meeting. I had two external shareholders, one who had put in 25,000, one had put 50,000 Naira, and I was the only executive director. The guys who came with me were still wearing their ranks. <laughs> because I told them, don't make the mistakes that Nigerian companies do, which is that they start their company and they call everybody director. I said, nobody is going to be called director here. You must wear the rank. If you are a director in this company, if you go to London, any of the advertising agencies, you will be hired as a director. I could guarantee that. Because I've been through the process. I've worked in the London office of my canary city, So I knew the system very, very well. And you see, because they saw me as their clear leader, they believed totally in what I told them. So that's also very important, that if you go into partnership or whatever it is, there has to be a clear leader. So did the operating plan, and at the board meeting, the director said to me, we noticed that you have inputted pay rises for these guys. And I said, yes. And they're like, but how can you do that? Not only have you even inputted pay rises, you were going to give some of them as much as 30% pay rise, 40% pay rise, and I said yes. I said, I need to motivate these guys because I know where I'm headed. And one of them said, it's not going to happen. So I said, wait a minute. I invited you here to participate as a shareholder. You are not going to run this business with me. You are non-executive director. And he said, no, 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 but our money is there. I said, okay, there's a problem. Anyway, one of them said to me, you know what? This is your company. Give me my money back. Six months, or I'll take you to court. Take your company to court. And we didn't have clients. We had just a few clients. 
I couldn't, we couldn't afford to pay back 50,000 naira in six months. There was no way. But God had a purpose. Second year, we got our first lucky break. In fact, we were not even invited to that pitch. That was the turning point of what is now known as inside communications. I had a friend who also works in an advertising agency, still remains my friend. He became a senator as well. And he said to me, he said, Bjorn, do you know this client is throwing their business on the pitch? They were just coming to the, into that business area. And would you like me to introduce you to one of their directors? I said, I'll appreciate that. So he did. And we got invited, the 13th company to be invited for that pitch. So we pitched, quite long story short, we won the business. 1.5 million naira. 1.5 million naira. And everything started happening. So the company grew and grew, started hiring more people. About 12 months later, Nestle came to me. They walked to my office and said, We've seen what you're doing for those guys. And they were in, you know, they had Milo. We were doing a brand that was very competitive with Milo. Nestle gave us a budget of about, I think at the time, 2.5 million naira. So things were happening. One day in 1984, the managing director of Chilbert Pons called me and said, Bjordan, look, I'm not happy about an aspect of the advertising that you do for us, particularly our outdoor advertising. We go around this cities and the sites are broken down, da, da 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 posters are falling off. And I said, but I'm not in that business. We use outdoor companies. That's their job, they're supposed to, but we talk to them. He said to me, what? he said, look, if my people give me any report about any site that's not in good condition, I'm going to take the entire, my entire business from you. So I came back to the office. I called my guys, I said, look, that's what, an English guy, I said, this is what Chris Ethan has told me. We've spoken to all these outdoor companies. They won't do anything. They keep making promises. I've decided what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my faith in my hands. I'm going to start an outdoor company. And they're like, how are you going to do that? I said, there's a small company in the East. We're going to buy that company. So we went, bought that company. It became our second company, set that up, was running, and the company started doing very well. They had the cleanest sites in Nigeria. Now, other advertising companies did not patronize them because in their heads, we're helping be able to make more money. But guess what? The clients would drive around town and say, that that's the cleaner site, and they would say, agency A, why are you not using that company? We go around, they have the cleaner site, my outdoor business should go to that company. So the clients were forcing them to use our company. That company grew and became the biggest outdoor company in Nigeria. It's called Optimal Exposure. For those of you who know Lagos very well, if you're coming from the island, you want to climb the IBBD, there's a massive board on your right. That belongs to us, one of our sites. Those are the kind of things that we do. That site alone can generate one billion naira revenue per annum. That site that you find before you climb that bridge, can generate one billion naira revenue every year. I'm not, I'm not in that business, but we needed to start that. And from then, we started other companies. We started the first PR company in Nigeria called the Quadrant Company. We started the second advertising. In fact, by our 10th year, we have become the biggest advertising company in Nigeria, beating Lintas, OBM, all those guys. Now, we started getting into conflict areas. Oh, by the way, one of the things I did very quickly was to say, you know what? This advertising company, we need to find a technical partner, an affiliate, so that we can begin to up our game. So we came to New York, found a company called Ted Bates, who partnered with us. In fact, I met them in 1981 in Brazil. I went on a conference, and the CEO who ran the global business was there as well. I'll finish, Ben, don't worry. Quite a long story short, we signed up with Ted Bates, and they helped us in developing our talents. Because I was clear in my head that what would help us make the difference is our people. And that's what you have in this room. 
people with knowledge people with skills before you need we started a second company because we are having competing brands at the time we started a company called MCNA and then we had to fold that up so it went on and on and on and on every aspect of marketing communications we went into and we were very successful and we became number 1 in every business area that we went to The one that took everybody by surprise was how we got into security, in the security business. Because I need to stress here again, there was something that some of you guys said when you came here about, you know, we don't want anybody, we are comfortable here in the United States. All right? And therefore, we don't have to go anywhere. No, I disagree with that. How many Dr. Badiros can you find? How many of the top cardiologists that came up here that can we find? But you guys cannot stay here and hope, except you want to go through the capital market and invest and buy whatever you want to buy. But if you really want to make a difference, because you're talking of 180 million people, I think you've got to come back to Nigeria because the opportunities are there. And that's what we did. Let me give you an example of our security company. That came out of something that could have been disastrous. This day in 1992, I believe it was, my wife was in New York. And she was due to come back the following day when this thing happened. And my phone rang. And I picked the phone. I thought she was saying, don't send the driver. She was calling to tell me, don't send the driver to the airport. This is of Nigeria ways. Nigeria ways to fly to New York. So I'm going to say, don't send the driver because, because, because they've either canceled the flight or whatever. But it wasn't my wife. And I sleep very, I tend to sleep very early. And some guy said to me, very heavy drawl, American accent, listen, we're coming to your house. Get a hundred thousand naira radio, we'll blow your ass. Very deep voice. So I dropped the receiver. I jumped out of my bed. I'm like, did I dream? No, I wasn't dreaming. Some guy actually called me. So I called the police. I called the police. The police came. I told them, listen, this is what's happened. Can you, at the time, we lived in the Kedja. So I said, can you please mark, mount a roadblock in front of my house till the morning? Because these guys have said they're And the police said, no, don't worry. We'll keep an eye on your area. Blah, 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 blah. You know, typical police, I gave them some money. And they said, don't worry. We'll, we'll keep an eye. And then they left. This was about 10 minutes to 1 in the morning. So I couldn't sleep. I got into my pair of jeans and I wore a pair of t-shirts. And at 10 minutes to 3, I had this creature of a car in front of my house. Quickly jumped up, went to the window, and I looked out. And the four doors flung open. And four guys came out and they walked towards my gate. I started rattling the gate and said, security. I had a security company looking after my house. Security. So the security guys came out and walked towards the gate, and then noticed that they weren't policemen. As the guy made to go back, they shot towards him. They didn't quite hit him. So I'm like, okay, now these guys have really come. Thankfully, I had a gun at home myself. I had a license to carry a gun. So I took my gun, went to my window, opened, and opened fire. And then they shot back and said, oh my God, this man get gone though. Why didn't concern us come this kind of place? <laughs> da, da, da. So they shot, I shot again anyway. The shooting must have gone on for like about, and I don't forget at the time. I had little children, my kids were young. This was 1992. I mean, the youngest of them at the time, when I was trying to evacuate them to another part of the house, was about three years old. The girl has a doctorate degree, she, she's a chemical engineer now. Um, and I tell her, I remind her of the story, and she says, Daddy, don't tell me that story again. She was three years old. She was very, those kids were very traumatized. So anyway, the shooting went on for about 30 minutes. And then there was a lot. It was January, Hamatan in Nigeria. Visibility was very poor. After a lull, I looked at it again, and then saw shadows. 
I'm like, these guys have come back. And then we started shooting. Shooting continued till quarter past 7 a.m. the following day. We're talking entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is about the possibility to see what others don't see. One, two, for you to know that you make a difference in doing that thing. And three, that you are passionate about what you want to do. Those, for me, are the secrets of entrepreneurship. You must be able to see something that others are not seeing or not seeing properly. What I saw that night after all that incident was that I had a useless security company. That's what I saw. And then I said, okay, after the incident, I said to my guys, we need 36 guards, you know, offices, homes. We don't want all this big guard that people are using. Can you go to the top security companies in Lagos? Tell them we need 36 guards. And there wasn't a company in Lagos that could give us 36 guards. Not one. They said we had to wait for six months. So I'm like, so we're going to wait for six months? By which time they would have killed everybody, huh? So what are the options? I went to a friend of mine who was a commissioner of police at the time, who eventually became an inspector general of police, Muslim Smith. He was a commissioner of police. I went to him and I said, M.A.K., what does it take to own a security company? So he told me, you have to apply to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. They will do a check for the shareholders and directors. They do a security check, blah, blah. Anyway, he told me all these things. So I said, start to finish, how long will it take? He said three months. So I said, okay, I'll up for three months. So I applied. And I took my guys, my colleagues, and they were, we were shareholders and directors. We didn't need anybody. We didn't need a policeman. We didn't need, we didn't need a soldier. You know, it used to be the case in those days, you had to go and find a politician or somebody. I said, no, no, I'm not going to by that route at all. So we applied. We got the license. I went to MAK. Now, I have the license. How are you going to help me find the people who are going to do the thing? I'm not a security person. So MAK said, Bjorn, don't worry. Help me pick the guys, and they recruited. And I said, that's it, yeah, just to guide us. Just us. But I was very heavily traumatized. If I, what I didn't tell you was that the police kept me for two days because I shot some of their men very badly. <laughs> so anyway, oh, by the way, why did I, why did I even purchase a gun? Professor Shoenka, he'd become a hunter. I just liked the guy. And I thought I could be like him, so I bought a gun, I was hunting. <laughs> you know, Professor Shoenka and ourselves, are, we are family friends now. But I have never really told him the story why I actually had a gun. But they said, to me, you need to send me bullets. So I send him bullets, even now. You know. Um, so kind of long story short, we started, but I said to my guys, this security company must be different from all the security companies in Nigeria in their service delivery. Now, I didn't know anything about security, but I was quick. I said, I will go and find technical partners, and I went all over the world looking for a company to partner with us. And I went and I looked, and I said, America is not going to work for me. The systems here are too, there's 24 hours electricity. I don't want this kind of company. They're using all these remote gates and things. That's not going to work in Nigeria. So I went around Europe, everybody. So I went to South Africa. So I found technical partners in South Africa. And I said, you know what? You're going to train these guys. They'll come here. You will come and train our guys. And I looked at the model. We'll have a security school. Da, 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 da. In fact, today, we are partnering with a university. And there is a program in law that combines security, we run the side of, that side of the security element today. So when we started that company in 1992, Tysis Guards, today it employs 18,000 people. And it is the biggest security company in Nigeria. And so we have, in fact, gone into real estate, we have really diversified our business. But our core is still marketing communications. That's our core. That's where our heart is. People, that's what people know us for. That's what Ben knows me for. 
But the point that I'm making is that if we could do it back home, the chances are that you would do it even much better. But, like I told somebody, if there are three or four or five or six of you, I mean, tell you the thing about medicine. If somebody was saying, oh, we've got to wait for government. You don't have to wait for government. There's a hospital, there's a, there's a, I don't want to call it hospital, there's a clinic in Lagos called First Cardiology. Some of you may know of Yemi Johnson. And, and when, Yemi Johnson, when Yemi Johnson first started First Cardiology, first thing for him, because he was diaspora, it was not difficult to find out what his expertise was. You can always find that out. All right? And when he came, he was consulting for some hospitals and things and, 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 and carrying out operations. But the guy felt that he had to do this thing on his own steam. And then, I understand, he invited some other Nigerians in the diaspora who perhaps we are throwing up all the challenges. You know I mean, this thing is not going to work. You know I mean, there's no electricity. You know I mean, the nurses are not well educated. You know I mean, you guys have come, you have to come and make that difference. <coughs> Dr. Kuda, I see, is doing it. He started. And I've gone to see him. And I know what he's doing. He's working with Nigerian nurses, but he's, he's polishing them. And they're getting better and better. It doesn't matter what area of business that you, and, and um, you have to pardon me, the, the pharmacist who has also established something, has employed maybe 20 or 40 pharmacists in Nigeria now, working with various teaching hospitals. That's how to go about it. You can imagine if two or three of them had bunched together, they would have covered the entire Nigeria, even maybe done it much better. Because, you know, three, three, the knowledge of three people cannot be compared to that of one person. So what I'm saying, in effect, is that there is absolutely no reason why you guys should not come and invest in Nigeria. Absolutely no reason. Because you've got very fertile ground there. And honestly, don't believe what anybody tells you about, oh, no, 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 no. What are you going to do there? It's too difficult. It is difficult. But I promise you something. I would not trade Nigeria for anywhere, personally. <laughs> because, because the opportunities are vast. I can tell you that. The opportunities are vast. And with the exception of one of my children who... I don't know, I wouldn't say unfortunately, she, she decided to live in England because her, her husband is also English, she's also English, and um, her parents in law also live in England, so the motivation for them is very, very narrow. But even at that, we are still putting pressure to say, come back. All our children have come back home. All of them. We have five, four of them are back home, and they are making their own little contribution to the Nigerian economy. Actually, one of them works at the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Uh, <laughs> um, so I want to encourage you that you don't necessarily have to work for government. Honestly, you don't necessarily have to work for government, particularly at the standards and levels you have attained. Because perhaps you probably will find frustration there. I would also tell you that even us, we still have frustrations working with government. There are huge challenges. And i give you an example before I round up. One of our businesses. I, as a matter of fact, don't like to do things with government. I'm very embarrassed saying this. But it's fact. Why? A lot of people who work on that side don't understand the, the, the pressure, the constraints of working in the private sector. So you, you get a government concession, for example, to do something like we did. And honestly, I told my guys, don't let's do this business. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't listen. 
Because there's good money to be made there, I must tell you. So we got the first concession. It ran out. They renewed the concession second time. And then suddenly, a government official says, Oh, why? I also want to bring my own people. Just like that. So, and I went and I said, no, you can't do that. There's a concession. There's an agreement. This thing must run its course. So we talked and talked and talked. And then, reluctantly, she's, this, a minister, by the way, said to me, um, you know, what I want is, we want an upgrade. We want, you know, said a whole lot of things. So I said, okay, all right. But that's going to call for massive investment. So we went and borrowed the money from the bank. That's where you begin to run into problems with government. We went to borrow money from the government and then started acquiring um, all of the platforms that you would need to use. Then they woke up and said, you know what, um, actually we want to renovate so you can't deploy the things you've acquired. You've acquired these things at future. We had gone to borrow over one billion naira. Over one billion naira. Oh, but we need to carry out renovation. Anyway, that went through. That government's tenure ended. A new government comes in. Our concession was still on. And then, oh, they said, oh, but you guys are owing us. So I said, yes, we are owing you because we couldn't generate revenue. There's nowhere to use these platforms except on your site. You own the locations. We have the platforms. You said you were going to renovate. We couldn't display anything, so we couldn't display anything. Okay, now, if we can't, if we can't generate revenue, I can't pay you. Now, government doesn't understand that. They don't have that mentality. And then the new boss says, well, in that case, we're going to cancel the contract. We're going to cancel the concession. I said, but you can't cancel the concession. <laughs> this is the document. So he cancels the contract, concession, unilaterally. So I go to court. I take them to court. They don't understand that. And the minister is upset that I took him to court. For them, it's a personal thing. So, meanwhile, the life of the concession is gradually running to an end. Running, well, I still have maybe two more years. I'm like, but we have money tied down. We are owing the banks. It's generating interest. They don't understand that. So, you got to watch out. If you, I'm saying, yes, come and invest, but be careful. There are a whole lot of um, landmines, particularly if it's government. There are lots of landmines. So the guy goes behind us and selectively advertises the concession again. So thankfully, some people in government there tell us. So we take him to court a second time. And somebody is saying, but you know what? I have a couple of friends, like I have Ben. and I saw, So I, I said to them, they are, they are also government people, why don't you talk to this guy? And they talked to him, and they, they're like, but do you know this, you can't mess with this guy. This guy is doing legitimate business. Is that a, we all admire him. And he says, yes, yes, I know, I know. But, but he took me to court. As if that's, that's a crime. <laughs> you ask yourself, what are the courts for? And this thing is still on as of today that I'm talking to you. So, uh, it's not all bed of roses. That's all I'm saying. You have to contend with the infrastructural deficits. You have to contend with all of these landmines that you find with government. And there are, I must also say there are also some very, very wonderful government um, 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 people who would help you get through and all that. But there are some who just... <laughs> I can't paint anything. I can't say politicians because that would be wrong. But, but there's people who, are, who hold political offices who just don't understand. Like, like, like uh, I don't know whether it was uh, uh, Governor B who said it. Yes, it was Governor B. 
People who have never run any business in their lives, they don't understand. And they do these things so ignorantly. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm imploring you, please come and invest in Nigeria, either through the stock exchange, or if you want to do things on your own, like I have done, employing about 20,000 people. I mean, just imagine, 20,000. And I can't even begin to tell you our salary bills. But I also don't want to share with you our turnover. Because it's something that anybody will be proud of. That we could generate that. You know? Um, so the more people like you come, that will give, uh, well, all the GDPs we are talking about will grow anyway. All right? So uh, I implore you to please come home and invest, and that together we can make Nigeria a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Come on, come on, guys. Come on, we can do better than that. Thank you so much, Mr. Banjo. This is an award I am particularly and especially proud to present because, because Mr. Shobanjo is not just um, one of our guest speakers. He's also my personal mentor. He's also a father figure to me. And um, he has supported me in all of my projects and ventures every step of the way. And I've taken his advice every step of the way. And like um, Mr. Drew Otoye alluded to, he's also my brother-in-law. He's married to my sister. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, please accept this on behalf of the NABF um, as, a, as a form of appreciation for your attending this conference and the presentation you just made. God bless you. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you, sir.